Thank you, Sherry, for being with me today and for responding to a few questions. Let's start with what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this project. I have three specific events that I can think to that think of that I always point to when I'm when I'm asked what really inspired me to do the work that I'm doing in the world. And when I was growing up, my grandfather was a huge influence in my life and was the the true head of the family in a lot of ways and watched over us and gave us a stern set of rules. And one of those rules was we could never cross the bridge that separated our small tribal community from the outside community. And he just told us, I can't keep you safe if you do that. And so when my cousin John and I were about 10 and 11 years old, we were riding around on our bikes and we decided that we were just going to cross the bridge to see what was on the other side and uh, what would happen to us if we crossed over there by ourselves. And, and then I remembered that there was something that I wanted to do really bad the weekend that was coming. And, and if I crossed that bridge and we got caught, I'd get grounded and I wouldn't be able to do what we were going to do that weekend. So I told John, let's wait till next week. And, uh, he said, no, I'm going to go. And he's like, you just wait here. I'm just going to go. I'm going to run right across the bridge and I'm going to turn around. And I'm going to come back. I said, okay. And so I was waiting for him, you know, maybe a mile away at the top of the hill near where we lived for him to come back. And uh, he left and probably, I don't know, 15 minutes later, 10 minutes later, he came back. And I could see as he was driving toward me, he had on these tan colored pants, like tan colored jeans. I could see that there was a huge blood stain going down the inside of one of his legs. And so I was at the bottom of the driveway uh, on my bike uh, and I started hollering for my mom, for his mom and my grandfather and my grandmother for somebody to come. And so he, you know, came into the driveway and he was crying and, you know, we were just little kids and my grandfather ripped his pants off. Poor John. I always tease him about that. And he had stopped on when he got to the other side of the bridge to his shoe had to come untied and he didn't want his shoelace to get stuck in his pedal on his bike. And so he leaned down to tie that shoelace. And right when he was lifting his head, he got shot um, with bird shot. Somebody had shot him with a, a shotgun with bird shot. And uh, they were clearly aiming for his head. Uh, if he hadn't lifted his head when he did, he, you know, he probably would have gotten shot in the head. And as it was, he got shot in his inner thigh. So it just missed a main artery that, you know, could have caused him to bleed out. He could have died. That was for no other reason other than that he was a uh, native person, that he was um, uh, Bunawab Skewi. And so uh, that really cemented in our minds, you know, we were about 10 at the time, that it wasn't safe for us on the other side of that bridge. Then uh, two years later, when we got to a certain uh, grade level, we had to cross the bridge to go to school. And then, oh, no, no, it's okay. It's fine now, you <laughs> know. But the treatment that we received when we did cross that bridge was not fine. It was not okay. The injustice of a lot of what we experienced in regard to discrimination within the school system was constant barrage against our self-esteem. And another incident, there was a young man from my community when I was a young girl, quite small at the time, probably seven or eight, a couple of years before this incident happened. And he was probably in his early 20s at the time. And he had been walking home from town from across the bridge. And he started being chased by the police. He hadn't done anything wrong. You know, the police just were following him and taunting him, according to some witnesses. Our treatment on the other side of that bridge was, was not good, you know, just based on my experience. And, and it wasn't good for other people as well in the community. And he was, he got nervous, uh, according to what many believe, that he was going to get beat up by the police. And so he started to run and he didn't think he was going to make it to the bridge before they caught him. So he went and he dove into the river to swim across to the island where we lived and the police shot him in the back and he died. He had done nothing wrong, you know, he was unarmed, like so many other people of color and black people right now that we're seeing getting killed by the police without any cause. That was powerful because even those who had, um, you know, allegedly been set 
up to protect us were a danger to us. And then uh, there were four young men from our community who went to Mount Katahdin to pray. And while they were there praying, they got beat up so badly by the KKK that they all ended up in the hospital. That story circulated around our community. Those things really cemented in my mind that level of inequity, injustice, lack of humanity with which we were met as Indigenous peoples. All of those things framed my character and really inspired me to want to do something to address those inequities and the lack of safety. Also, you know, they say that one in three Indigenous women are sexually assaulted in their lifetime in our community because we lived near a university. Every young woman in my age group was sexually assaulted, every single one. And at one point in my youth, there were some young men from our community who stood at the bridge and stopped every car that came over because there would be carloads of young men from the university who would come and they'd just grab young girls off the street, sexually assault them, and then, you know, throw them back at the end of the bridge. Even a young girl, a small girl, uh, probably four or five years old, that happened to, uh, not by the same group of people, but by those who felt that they were entitled to come into our community and to harm us. Those young men were labeled as troublemakers at the time, and I just saw them as warriors, you know, that they were protecting us in ways that nobody else would. You can't grow up in that environment without being inspired to want to create change. And so those are the types of things that that really influenced my young life. And then seeing the way that my grandfather worked so hard for the Wabanaki people throughout his lifetime, and the way that my grandmother showed up in regard to her kindness and charity and love for everybody. Those things also influenced me in a positive way. So I feel like those combined experiences really helped me to become the person that I am today and and really frame the work that I'm doing. Thank you, Sherry. Those are some very powerful stories. I'm amazed that this gave you courage as opposed to making you just be afraid to ever move out of your house. I think what it gave us was righteous fury to really stand up and say, no, we're not going to accept this any longer. So what continues to guide you or give you courage? The things that I speak of are continuing to happen. There was the appearance of change for a period of time in the last Uh, Four years, we've seen that appearance of change deteriorate before our eyes, and we see that all of the things that Indigenous people, Black people, other people of color have been talking about are still going on. They've just been hidden from the public eye in a lot of ways. And now there's no hiding from those things. So just for an example, in the last month, there have been four Indigenous people in um, Fabanaki territory who have been killed by police. There are countless indigenous women who are missing, go missing or murdered every single day. The injustices that have been built into the legal system, legal loopholes that make it possible and even attractive for predators to target indigenous women, which have never really been fully addressed. Uh, There's never been a real fix to the law that created that loophole. And other injustices where we're still in a period of termination, some decisions of the court have taken away rights uh, and brought us back to a termination era in regard to our rights as Indigenous peoples here in the United States, but also across the board, uh, all over the world, I do this type of work where Indigenous populations are on the front lines of environmental racism. They're on the front lines of climate change impacts. They're on the front lines of corporate destruction of not only the planet, but of people and other living beings. And so, you know, constantly seeing the injustice, the inequity and the suffering in that continues to inspire me to do this work. The press doesn't seem to give Indigenous people the front page stories that maybe other people of color get. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Um, There is an invisibility factor that's attached to Indigenous rights issues. It's a challenge that we have even talking to um, people in other targeted and minority populations about the inequity of the invisibility of Indigenous rights issues. The thing to remember, I think, for people is that Indigenous peoples of this land are the ones that all others have been able to elevate themselves against. 
So we are kind of the baseline that all of these other populations of people who came in and who were discriminated against have been able to elevate themselves uh, by standing on top of our bodies. Even many people within the slave population earn their freedom by killing Indians, becoming Buffalo soldiers. It's a tragic and horrific past that we share, but if we don't start telling the truth about the ways that the colonial settler system purposely divided people of color, purposely pitted them against one another, then we're never going to be able to truly unite and solve the problems that we share collectively in the world today. Given all of this, what advice do you have for youth activists? I think that um, what helped me the most and helped me to become effective Uh, because when I was much younger, I just railed against the system. The things that I was doing weren't effective. They weren't creating change. Uh, They were just creating more turmoil in my own heart and my own mind because I wasn't being effective. And so it just created the sense of hopelessness within me. For me, being able to go to my elders and to get advice from them to Uh, recognize that they had done many of the same things that I had done. They had walked almost the same path because these injustices are generations deep and that they had come to understand certain things throughout their journey that could benefit me and help me to become a more effective change maker in the world was invaluable to me. If I hadn't had those elders or if I hadn't been raised to respect and to honor what they had to offer to me and I, I hadn't listened to them, chances are I may not have survived to be the person I am today. And uh, to me, that ability to have elders in, in the movement, not just elders in the community or even elders in my family, some of whom may not have had the same inspiration and fire to challenge these things that I had, but elders within the movement those who I could go to and, you know, you were facing these same kinds of things and you've done all of this work. Um, Can you share with me what you feel the most important things are that you've learned along the way? I think that that was probably the most important thing for me to do as a young person to help realize that this is not a sprint, that this is a marathon and that being thoughtful, being strategic about the ways that we engaged these challenges was critically important, that they're not going to be solved overnight, that there is a process that has to unfold, and that there are steps within that process that need care and attention. And if we miss any of those steps, we're going to end up exactly where we are today, 50 years from now. Uh, So the Civil Rights Act was passed 50 years ago, and we are still having young Black men killed in the streets by police. We're still having all of the same types of violence against Black, Indigenous, and other people of color that we were having 100 years ago. And so if we don't really stop and do the work, right, instead of glossing over and pretending everything's fine, if we don't do the work that's required of us to transcend this illusion of separation and difference that we have, then we're never going to be able to actually create lasting change. And I think that's probably one of the most important lessons that we can learn from history is that a change in the law does not equate to a change in hearts and minds. In order for change to last, there has to be a change in hearts and minds. And we need to be willing to step up and do that work, even though it's very, very difficult, much easier to hate and to be angry than it is to engage another human being and look for the goodness in them and try to speak to that goodness and to stay with the process, educating others, educating yourself, healing your own wound. That work is is fundamentally important to the transcendence of incredible history of violence that we all have come out of and moving us into a future where we can be more um, aligned, where we can live in a more just and equitable society. All of those things uh, require us to really do that, that deep inner work on an individual level, on a group level, on a societal level, so that we can create lasting change. I am honored by being able to engage with the young people who are being born for this time. They just are coming in with exactly what we need to be able to move us forward. So 
it's a mutually beneficial relationship. I learn from them just as much as they'll ever learn from me, maybe more. Thank you so much, Sherry.